Many of this year's Lenten gospel lessons and now our passion narrative are from the Gospel of John. And as we followed John's story of Jesus' ministry over these past weeks, we've been able to sense a storm brewing. Jesus has been sowing seeds of eternal life, God's life, in which the hungry feast, in which bodies that have been damaged are healed, and those who have been deprived of breath in their lungs are given it back. The kind of life that Jesus has been planting feels like salvation, a salvation that threatens and disrupts the order of life established under Rome. And the authorities, having seen the attention and praise given to Jesus, sense a fomenting rebellion. And finally, in the garden, the storm breaks. The Jesus in John's gospel is far from surprised by this. He's been trying to warn his disciples about the fact that he'll die a humiliating death, assuring them, strangely, that this is God's plan, that he and God remain in perfect control. And now in the garden, as he confronts the harbingers of his violent death, Jesus seems almost not to flinch. He seems serene, which is something given the spectacle of imperial power on display here in the garden, a spectacle which is unique to John's gospel. This arrest scene has hundreds of soldiers brandishing weapons show up to arrest Jesus, an unarmed man. In our context, this might look like police in riot gear with armored personnel carriers, drones, tear gas, flash grenades. Such displays of power then and now are meant to intimidate, to remind those who dare to challenge the ways of empire of its power to crush them. But Jesus is ready to issue a reminder of his own. He approaches the guards and soldiers and says, who are you looking for? And they reply, Jesus, the Nazarene. And he says to them, I am. And the text says that the guards and soldiers fall to the ground. The Greek implies not that they fall back in spontaneous astonishment, which is how I read it at first, but that they fall prostrate. That the hundreds of weapon-clad officers put their faces to the ground before the alleged criminal they came to arrest. With the words, I am, Jesus invokes the name of the holy and living God, the God who came to Moses in a bush on fire and commanded him to free the Israelites in bondage. When Moses wanted to know what he should say to the people, if they asked him the name of the God who sent him, God said to Moses, I am who I am. So say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. There's a Jewish legend that the ancient historian Eusebius attributes to a writer who lived before Jesus' day. So perhaps Jesus and the author of John's Gospel were familiar with it. The story goes that when Moses stood before Pharaoh, that recalcitrant enemy of God's liberation, Moses uttered the secret name of God, I am and Pharaoh himself fell speechless to the ground. Now these many generations later at Passover, which of course commemorates the people's escape from slavery, Jesus identifies himself by the name of the God who liberates, the source of life, the I am, the God whose purposes will not be stopped by those who perpetuate oppression, the God who is not intimidated by shows of military might, the God who drowned Pharaoh's army in the sea and before whom the armies of empire fall trembling to the ground. The Gospel of John makes very clear that the powers of darkness, represented in this garden by hundreds of soldiers with torches and lamps, they don't hold a candle to the power of God burning in Jesus. There's no question, it's no contest. And for a moment, when the weapons intended to intimidate Jesus fall to the ground before him and faces are pressed into the dust, that truth is laid bare for all to see. And then, a moment later, the system snaps back into formation. Jesus will give himself over to it, and as he does, 
he will burn all the more brightly with that eternal life its weapons aim to extinguish.